Before we dive into our discussion and hear from our esteemed panelists, I'd like to take a quick moment to introduce myself. My name is Anne Bernice, and I am the Senior Marketing and Communications Manager at Paradigm Publishing Services, a division of DeGloreco. I graduated from Emerson in 2019. Um, and with that, I also like to hand over to my wonderful colleagues and fellow moderators today. Um, yeah, hi everybody. Thank you for joining us. My name is Tiana Snyder. I'm the Senior Manager for Paradigm Publishing Services, a division of DeGroyder Braille, and I graduated from Emerson in 2020. Hello everyone. Like my fellow panelists, I'm very excited to be a part of this webinar today. Um, my name is Kate Healy and I am the Boston Office Manager. I graduated Emerson with my Bachelor's and Master's in Publishing in 2023. All right, so now that you've heard from us, we'd love to take it over to our panelists. Um, and I think we are going to have Alison Shaw introduce herself first. Hi, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for being invited to this event. It's fantastic. So um, I've been told to talk about, or we've been told to talk about us rather than our presses. And that, <laughs> that indeed is an interesting challenge. So I've got to start off in that mode. So I'm chief executive and founder of Bristol University Press, which is um, a university press based in the southwest of England in the UK. Um, this was launched in 2016 and followed on from uh, my having with a with colleagues set up a press called Policy Press 20 years previously and before that actually a, a, a first imprint which was a research dissemination imprint at the university. But that's going way back 1989. My uh, introduction to publishing was actually with Bloomsbury as they first launched. So I was the publicity assistant in the first six months, I joined them the first six months of Bloomsbury launching. So a very interesting, exciting time to, to be part of a company that was growing and I got to see across the piece what uh, publishing was all about. So that's a great start. Well, thank you so much, Alison. We are now gonna move on to Lynn Reiner. Okay, um, I'm Lynn Reiner, and I am founder of Lynn Reiner Publishers, and we're just coming up on 40 years. Uh, like a lot of people, uh, I fell into publishing by accident. I thought I was going to be a doctor, and for a number of reasons, that didn't work out. Um, and uh, my first job in publishing was at Seventeen Magazine in New York, um, where I worked for a very strong woman who was the editorial director. Um, then some this and that, <laughs> and then I um, ended up being a freelance copy editor for Fred Krager, who was just starting Krager, uh, what, uh, Westview Press uh, in Boulder. It was just something I was doing before I moved um, to California. <laughs> so, um, but it kind of stuck. And uh, over the course of almost 10 years, I was, a, I started as a freelance copy editor. And after 10 years, I was running a company of 100 people, which was an amazing opportunity because um, I learned how to do every bit of what's involved in the publishing process. And Francis and I know each other from way back then. Um, and then I got fired, which is a whole other story, but I won't go into that now. And um, I had no intention of starting my own company. It's like I essentially had done that, you know, I built a company, but lots of people encouraged me to do, to do that. And I realized I didn't really want to work for some other company and have the same thing happen again. So, um, and then somebody told me I couldn't do it because I was a woman in Colorado. So, you know, I think for many of us, that's all it takes. Somebody says, you can't do this. <laughs> you know, I can too. <laughs> you know? so I got a bank to loan me money. I started my company and that was 40 years ago. So. Amazing. Thank you so much, Lynn. Um, we're now going to move on to Francis Pinter. Hello. Uh, how can I top that story? Um, <laughs> I, as Lynn says, uh, we knew each other from way back. But I started publishing at the age of 23, setting up my own publishing company, mainly because I didn't think I could get a job. I was finishing a PhD. I wanted to stay in the UK, even though I had an American passport. I needed a work permit, but I didn't have a job. So what was I going to do? So I set up a company and published one book and it was a great success. So I thought, wow, this is easy. So <laughs> that kept me in publishing for a long time, uh, about 20 years. My company was called Pinter Publishers and we did social sciences and humanities. 
And then I was headhunted by George Soros and worked mm -hmm. for the Open Society uh, Foundations in all of the post-communist countries helping develop the independent pri private publishing sector in the 90s. And that was a pretty heady time, uh, doing some wonderful projects, doing a lot of traveling and learning quite a lot. <laughs> uh, and then I moved back into uh, UK publishing and I was the founder of um, publishing founder of Bloomsbury Academic when Bloomsbury decided to go into uh, academic publishing. I then became uh, CEO of Manchester University Press. And I've always been very interested in how to, um, how to disseminate knowledge globally in an equitable way. And so I set up something called Knowledge Unlatched, and that's a whole hour of um, <laughs> what we did there with introducing new business models um, for open access. And I am now executive chair of the Central European University Press, which I actually founded 30 years ago, uh, and advisor to several uh, small uh, university and academic presses around the world, which keeps me informed about all the issues that confront scholarly publishing hopefully everywhere. <laughs> so that's me. Thank you so much, friends, uh, Francis. We are now going to move on to Jessica Mosher. Great. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, lovely to be here. I feel uh, very uh, honored to be with such an esteemed group of, of uh, presenters today. Um, uh, I'm the CEO for the University of Toronto Press, and uh, although we're supposed to talk about ourselves, not our press, I just wanted to mention, because the press is interesting, I joined it about two and a half years ago, uh, and it's uh, focused in scholarly uh, publishing, obviously, both books and journals, we do some course materials, but we also have a distribution arm, uh, which is very interesting, so we distribute our own works, and then a, a, a number of uh, university presses, and a lot of trade publishers as well. Uh, and then we run the University of Toronto bookstores. So uh, I love uh, the company and the role because I get to play in sort of different spaces all around co great content, um, which sort of it mimics my career, actually. I've been very, very, very fortunate. Um, and uh, I've been in publishing for about 30 years now. Um, most of it in higher education publishing, uh, but I also did a stint in K-12, which was fascinating. Uh, in ed tech, uh, as well as trade. Um, and now I get to do the scholarly and academic, and it's amazing, uh, the whole journey. Primarily in Canada, but I worked for about eight years in the US as well. So, uh, and what I love about the University of Toronto Press is, is a lot of our content and our audience is very global. So uh, I love that aspect of, of what we do, but um, that's it for me for now. Thank you so much, Jessica. And um, last but certainly not least, we're going to have Marion Berghan introduce herself. Oh, Marion, it looks like you're muted. Sorry, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Where should I start? Uh, I started more as an academic. I did a PhD on um, the relationship of Black Americans. In, uh, to Africa, that was an American studies, which got me into uh, contact with anthropology because I had to read up on racism and I discovered cultural relativism, which to me was an enormous discovery. And that, uh, that um, gave me the idea to, to go into anthropology and do a bit more and, and study there. Um, and while I was studying that, um, what was developed, the idea of doing anthropology in your own country. So by the time I, I got my, uh, I didn't, I finished my MPhil, which I needed to do because I didn't have an undergraduate degree in Cambridge and in anthropology. Uh, uh, by that time it was discovered, okay. yeah, doing anthropology of your own country. So I thought, ah, oh, why don't I do that? Because so, by that time uh, we had three kids, one of my them is there, Vivian, <laughs> it's one of the kids. Uh, so I couldn't just apply anywhere as an academic, so I decided to to do an, um, refugee in, uh, a German refugees in London. 
and uh, that uh, there are various reasons why I chose that topic. And uh, there I discovered that um, there were quite a few that publishing is, is quite a German a cultural trait, Jewish as well as non-Jewish. So, so among all the people I interviewed, there were quite a few people linked uh, or had positions in publishing, either director or at a, at a lower level and so on. And they encouraged me then to start my own company once I was done with that particular study. <clears throat> and I thought, fine, why don't I do it? But so many have done start in the uh, in the front room of our very lovely Victorian house in Leamington Spa, where we lived at the time. And uh, I had no idea what I was getting myself in, in for. And one, actually one of the people I interviewed, she worked for Peter Owen, another refugee publisher. And she had a friend, someone who had a printing business with her husband in Leamington. And she said, Juliet, why don't you go to Mary and help her? She wants to start a publishing company. She hasn't a clue. <laughs> And uh, she came <clears throat> and joined me and then took over production and really helped me then to get started. Uh, how we financed that, I have no idea, but somehow it worked out. And now looking back, I'm quite impressed about the quality of, of the books. From the, I, I focus very much on translation, that's from German and French into English. And in that case, I attracted... Uh, there were quite a few well-known authors who had no idea how small I was. They didn't care. They only wanted the book out in English. And that attracted then uh, British and American authors saying, oh, you have so-and-so on your list. Why don't you have my book? So that, that's how I grew the company. And then uh, <coughs> it was first book publishers, which some of you I won't sure remember. And then... Uh, then we moved to the States, but we kept, I kept the office in, in Oxford, and I had stupid partners who were supposed to look after the actual office oh, yeah. while I was building up an office in, in the States. It was in Providence in Rhode Island at the time. And they wanted to sell the firm, and I didn't, so they forced me out. And uh, I remember in October 93, I was forced out, and then in January 94, I started. So quite a few authors came to me and took the manuscripts away and other institutions said they had heard what happened, terrible, and they helped me also financially to to get uh, going again. I, I just want to say that Francis was uh, one of my inspirations. Remember Francis, a long time when we met, you were still the director of the ITG, and she was a real inspiration for me. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <laughs> 30, 40 years later. <laughs> Thank you so much, Marianne. I think all of us can tell what a, what a great wealth of experience and insights all of you bring to this panel. And we'd love to dig a little bit more into that experience in publishing. Um, so I'd love for some of you to talk about starting your own company or making career moves to switch industries or anything else you've experienced along your journey. And along those lines, if any of you could speak to some of the roadblocks you encountered along the way. It's an open-ended question. Any of you can start with it. Okay, so yeah, I went first before, so I, <laughs> I can carry on. Um, uh, I think, yes, roadblocks, it's, it's interesting. I, I went, um, I joined a, a university, um, as, I, as I said, and um, I was I was there developing a research dissemination wing, which would now... I, I guess would fit with a lot of the open access presses that are starting within within universities now. Um, and I think I was personally always driven by um, tackling social problems. It's always been, you know, a kind of social mission that's always been at the heart of what I've been interested in. And I just ended up, luckily enough, working within a social and public policy department that um, integrated academic work with um, people, professionals, service users, you know, uh, policy makers. And um, looking back at that time, what is, a, a, is hard to uh, imagine, I guess, is that when I joined, we had one PC, I think we had just got, we had no email, we had no web, <laughs> you know, there was no, you know, there, it's, it makes me feel completely ancient, but I'm sure other people on the panel will uh, recognize this. But looking back, you know, how, how very different it was. 
but we were still driven by the same things. We still wanted to get academic research out into the world and to, to make a difference. And I was lucky enough to, to be able to um, set up a company called Policy Press, which focused particularly on social and public policy and that engagement. Um, and within, a, within an academic institution, so although, um, and maybe I'll come on to this later when we have some other some of the other questions. Although um, uh, we had some some uh, tacit support, I was very clear that um, I didn't want to be at that time University of Bristol Press or Bristol University Press because um, I felt it was important that we kind of proved our worth before we, uh, you know, before we ended up in university politics. So we very much started as a specialist and gradually increased the disciplines that we worked in and our international range. I mean, now um, uh, I think we've got you know, content in 9,000 uh, uh, organizations around the world in 196 countries. In those days, <laughs> if somebody had said that to me, I would have been absolutely astonished. That just was, you know, not there. But after 20 years of actually, we didn't have investment from the university. It was very small in oh. And that's something that, again, I can come back to, but, you know, not everything happens instantly. And I'm sure there's, there'll be lots of stories from all of us that, you know, it takes many years of, of kind of just, just delivering, just doing um, uh, to get there. We did, we did launch Bristol University Press in 2016, and it was in the, in our 20th anniversary year for Policy Press, and we won a big independent publisher of the year award in the UK. But it's interesting to think of those, those roadblocks. What are the roadblocks? Um, I think it's, oh yeah, starting from scratch in, in an organization where you don't even know that they want a publishing company is kind of an interesting one <laughs> and navigating that. So I haven't had to navigate a lot of what Francis or Lynn or Marion has had to in terms of setting up a company um, that is reliant on your own cash flow and your own, you know, I've been within a bigger institution or our team have been within a bigger institution. But we also have to deal with different kinds of uh, politics. So we are, we are constrained by university HR policies and, you know, and finance policies and lots of things that don't allow us the kind of flexibility to, um, to move as agilely as we, as we might want. So, Whereas I don't actually have to worry about whether I can pay people at the end of the month, which is a massive, massive difference. You know, I mean, I just, you know, there is some, there is a big organisation that allows us to be secure in the fact that, I mean, obviously, if we stop making money, then, <laughs> then, you know, life would be different. But in terms of a, a kind of monthly cash flow, we don't have to worry about that. But we do have to do a lot of navigating within an institution. And that's a kind of, so in terms of roadblocks for us, Sometimes that's been that's been trickier. We made our name externally before we made our name internally. So that's helpful. I think that's really interesting because it's so different to what I experienced in the first 20 years of my work life, which um, well, I'll just give you as little two little stories. One, I was so poor and Lynn was so poor that we used to go to the Frankfurt Book Fair and we would share a room in a hotel called the Hotel Eden. And the reason we lived there was because it was the cheapest hotel in Frankfurt in the middle of the red light district. I hope none of you have to do that again, apart from the pleasure of Lynn's company. Uh, it, it really was not very agreeable. And I gather the uh, hotel has been renovated in the last few years. But I do want to talk about something quite serious, which is I would have, if I could turn the clock back, I would have learned more about finance in the very early days. I started my company in 1973, and it was only in 1986 that I had any external investment from a proper investment company. Up until then, I funded it through mortgaging my flat when I finally got around to buying a flat and otherwise off of credit cards during some very hairy times when interest rates were 15% per annum. 
So the growth was perhaps slower than it needed to have been because of just not having the investment and not recognizing what I had and having the contacts and the know-how to be able to present this financially. I certainly was able to present it uh, from a mission point of view um, because I was always getting up uh, at all sorts of events saying how important the mission of my my little company was. Um, we were publishing young authors. We were publishing interdisciplinary works. Uh, we were doing all sorts of interesting things, but that wasn't going to bring in the money, the investment. So um, I I think I would have, could have used some more training in finance uh, in the early days. So, um, okay. did you have more fences? Nope. Oh, so, okay, so um, just thinking about roadblocks and also advantages, um, I'll talk, well, I am fortunate in that I don't think that I did have roadblocks. That doesn't mean that things never happened that were difficult. Um, and when I was working at Westview, running a company, um, I was fairly young and um, there were people who um, couldn't believe that I was doing that on my own merit. Um, so I had to deal with some of what I guess we call, you know, sexism through that, you know, she slept her way to the top, um, literally. <laughs> but um, I had support from the rest of the staff. And I was able to say to one person, you have a very rich fantasy life and um, fire him. But but that doesn't mean it wasn't hurtful. Um, and it wasn't something that, um, you know, I mean, I had to deal with. So, so I don't think of that as a roadblock. Um, I think that what Francis said about um, having some fi financial knowledge was an advantage that I had, not because I came, you know, ready-made with it, but because at Westview, I was responsible for that entire company. Um, and one of the big lessons I learned from that is that I do not like owing money um, because we ended up at one point owing a lot of money and the prime rate was something like 17%. And so it was, it, you know, it was very, very difficult. Um, and having to deal with banks who said, we're going to shut you down was, um, again, a, an amazing lesson. Um, and one, one of those banks I went to and borrowed money. Um, but I think that something that's really been important to me, and I think would be important to any of the students who are, who are here, is that um, you decide what you want to do, and you assume that you're going to be able to do it. I mean, I think that the hard thing is deciding what you want. And I'm not a Pollyanna, right? Bad things happen. Bad things happen to good people. Things don't always work. But I had this idea that I wanted to be um, have a, be a publisher of a sort that didn't really, to my knowledge, exist at the time, which was to have the quality level of a university press with the efficiency um, and speed that is required if you're going to be able to stay afloat without any outside funding. Um, and publishing colleagues, for the most part, were very um, supportive. But some said, you can't do that. That's not possible. You can do it this way. Or you can do it that way. Um, but I just made up my mind. <laughs> That's what I was going to do. And I, I do believe that um, if you feel strongly about something, you know, you make a choice. And then it's, you know, people would say, do you think it's going to work? It's like, well, if I didn't think it was going to work, I wouldn't be doing it. You know, And at some point you realize, OK, you're a personal guarantor on a loan. Well, you know, in for a dime, in for a dollar, you know, it's just maybe it's not going to work, but you have to believe that what you're doing is going to work. Otherwise, why do it? Yeah. Uh, absolutely. I think I think that's um, such a good point about you just have to really want what you're about to do. Um, we spoke, we asked a little bit about switching career industries and Jessica, I know you've recently, in recent years, moved um, kind of into the university press background. Um, can you speak a little bit about that switch? 
Yeah, uh, absolutely. Actually, it sort of ties, um, although my experience, uh, again, I haven't started a company from scratch. I haven't done um, what the other panelists have done, which is incredible, um, uh, each and every one of them. Um, when we talk about roadblocks and and I, what Lynn was saying really resonated on that belief um, I've been very fortunate, um, you know, it's never a good time to go. Um, uh, you'll always be busy. You'll always have something that you can't let go. You'll always have an author or somebody that, you know, without you, it's not going to happen. Um, but actually, because um, if you're ever ready to go, maybe you've waited a little bit too long. Um, so I've been fortunate throughout my career uh, to be, in, be offered sort of stretch opportunities. Um, uh, everything from, you know, I had success in Canada. So they said, come down to the US, 10 times the size. Um, you got to get to know it right away. We have a particular project you not need to head up. It was, it was a big stretch um, and being able to show, okay, my belief in, in what I'm doing, my belief in the people around me, building great teams, it's transferable. Um, but I do think that belief that Lynn talked about is critical. You'll run into roadblocks all the time with whatever career you choose. Now, I'm very uh, privileged in many ways and all those pieces. So so uh, so when I say that, I recognize I'm, I'm not dealing with certain roadblocks that others will be dealing with. Um, but I do think that ability to stretch and try is important. And so that led me to uh, an opportunity in the US, which led me to a larger opportunity back in Canada, which led me to a different part of the publishing industry, which led to another. So it, I think it's taking those opportunities and stretching yourself, even if you're not fully matched um, uh, and that belief. So uh, so that for me has, has, has afforded me a very interesting uh, career. So far, it's not over. <laughs> Just one little addendum, if I may, be, um, I don't want to hog this, but um, you were talking about um, moving, you know, uh, taking on new opportunities. And one thing I, I did want to mention is that um, making decisions solely on the basis of earning more money somewhere is not necessarily the best way to go. And that um, when I look at my trajectory, whether in publishing or, or just in general, uh, stepping back in terms of income was the right thing to do because of the fit of the job and the opportunity that lay ahead. So I, I wanted to add that to what Jessica said. And can right. I add oh. a little bit to that as well, which is, I think it's very important to recognize that um, you're not born with your mission statement that's easy to recognize and pursue for the rest of your life. Uh, towards the end of your career, you can begin to see the patterns as they evolved in your life. That's easier than being able to say when you're young exactly what you want to do. So I would just encourage young people to... Um, take on jobs where they're learning a lot and you know if it doesn't suit or they find their direction is changing then to find a new home um thank you thank you all for that um i think that's coming from an uh, early in my career this is reassuring to hear and also interesting to learn about um, kind of the spaces that I should maybe take opportunities to learn more about as I'm um, advancing. Um, I hope our audience feels the same way. Um, we've spoken a little bit about roadblocks, but you've also all achieved so much and received many honors across the board. Are there any achievements or career milestones, big or small, every day or really large, um, that any of you would like to tell us about in a little bit more detail? I'd love to hear Marion's uh, account of that. Um, about board of us. Um, how I developed my list. Yeah. An honor that that touched you. Something that because uh, you've received so many, I can only imagine, Marianne. Um, <laughs> the uh, anthropology, um, ex excellence, uh, especially was noted that we are not uh, we don't have a university press to a university to protect us so that we did it uh, so that was mentioned uh, that 
in particular. Um, but um, I was, otherwise, how I got into I started by sort of with the German uh, European list because my husband is an historian and he was very well connected, still is. Uh, and so, therefore, I had a, quite a few connections to, to German and other European historians uh, who, as I say, then came to me for were keen after books translated. So that got me, and we still have a very strong uh, a German Central European list. And um, then one day, uh, I was approached by a very well-known anthropologist. Um, from the, he was then at uh, UCL, University College London, and, and, and suggested that uh, he said we are looking for a, a publisher who is um, ready to to do something new and not. We are fed up with Cambridge University Press, which was then the leading publisher in anthropology at the time. And uh, there was another press, and we have, I think, Bradford, she said, yeah, we, we had enough, so we are looking for someone. Would you be prepared? And, and I said, oh, fine, I would be happy to be back in my field. And so he invited me to to, to go visit the uh, department uh, at, at UCL. And, uh, and as soon as I entered it, because before, when I was still deciding with whom to do my PhD, I, there was also some anthropologist at uh, UCL who interviewed me and so on, but I didn't particularly like her. So, but as soon as I entered college, I felt like a student again. Uh, and then when we were sitting in the office, I was surrounded by these well-known people whose books I had read, and I felt, yeah, I felt like a student. And they looked to me like someone with a publisher, like someone with a publisher. Authority. <laughs> so I felt like they always talking to someone sitting next to me. <laughs> it was difficult to to go to to change my my role. Um, but it worked out, and that was the beginning. And now we are considered one of the leading, not some people would say, the leading publisher in in social anthropology. And so for me, it's very nice to be back in my field, um, so to say. You know. Um, yeah, we're still growing, but we have to broaden our list. We are now going also more into sociology because anthropology is a sort of more limited field. But uh, it's the question for us, especially it's more a publisher, either be a small fish in a big pond or be a big fish in a small pond. So with anthropology, we are big fish in a small pond. But we also try in our other ways of, uh, you know, in history, so that we are more a smaller fish in a big pond because that's still quite a popular field. But it's doing well for us because we are connected with quite a few institutions, uh, German institutions uh, in the in the states as well as in Britain, who do series with us and then you know pay pay for the production of the books and so on. So that is quite quite nice speaking of finances. Uh, I I never learned really about it, but I started with the uh, overdraft and uh, with the mortgage on our house um, and uh, but was very glad when this came down and down and so on. Our mortgage was then finally paid off. <laughs> that was a great relief. So. But, <laughs> yeah. Me too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, Marian. I think uh, Michael had a great point in the chat, but he'd love to hear Lynn, Allison, and Francis's response to this question as well, if any of you are willing to answer. I'm willing to answer. Um, and I'm just curious as to whether mine or you know, Francis and Allison's from um, you know smaller companies, how, how they would relate to things that, that might that might ring true more for Jessica. But um for me, you know, the you know where does the what are the what we're we talking about the miles the milestones or the honors? Um, I mean the the big one is sort we survived you know we survived without any um, support from a university or you know, or anything like that so that's the big one but on a day to day basis because that's really what we're, this is all about it's like what do we do day to day I mean you know you're sitting at a desk you're slogging through pieces of paper so for me you know getting an email 
from someone, or it used to be actually a letter. I love letters. Um, you know, saying that publishing with us made a huge difference in that person's life or meeting someone at a conference who talks about that, you know, and, and relationships with people that I've never even met face to face, but want to let me know when they have a kid or, you know, when they receive an honor. I, and really on a day-to-day -day basis, I have to say that is a lot. Um, we recently got an email from someone who was asking to be removed from uh, our mailing list because he was retiring and took the time to write a two page letter about his reaction to our list um, and how he admired it. I mean, that I can get by on that, you know, for weeks. Um, or I've been, um, you know, honored by the African Studies Association or a panel at the International Studies Association, knowing that, you know, your colleagues think highly of what you do. Um, that is really for me um, huge. And I want to take this opportunity to respond to one of the comments who said something about, um, you know, we've talked about how fortunate we are, um, but it's not just about fortune. I interestingly, had a conversation about that with a dermatologist this the other day. Um, I think it's, it's not one or the other. I think that we have to recognize, especially the panelists that you have here, we have to recognize our privilege. Um, and that some things are accidents, whether of, of you know of birth or other things. I mean, you know, a lot has to do with the nature of the computer that you were born with um, in your brain. <laughs> so um, there is luck, but it's also true that choices, it's what you do with that luck that makes a difference. So I, I don't think that by us all saying how fortunate we feel that we're doing that women thing, <laughs> I think that we're recognizing that we have had good fortune and that we have been privileged in many ways. But yeah, what happened with that is a result of what we did with that good fortune. So, okay. Totally agree with you there, Lynn. I mean, I think um, good fortune, absolutely. Luck, absolutely. Being in the right place at the right time. But I don't think any of us would have managed to do what we've done without turning those opportunities into actually doing stuff. You know, there's nothing, there's no getting away from the fact you just got to get some stuff done. And, and you know, and I think that is, uh, yeah, that's something that um, I'm always like, take a deep breath, you know, know where you're going, just, you know, plan, get on with it, take opportunities when they when they come along. I think the hardest thing actually about opportunities is, is, is not um, wanting to take every single one. I'm, I'm somebody who goes, oh, yeah, oh, oh, new, new, new. And uh, my very excellent team are constantly telling me to know, to <laughs> make sure that we focus. And I think that that's, that's very wise. Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, again, you know, back to your response about, um, you know, feedback. I mean, you know, I my heart still sings every time we get some great feedback from authors. You know, that's our lifeblood. I mean, I know it's often said, but without our authors, you know, I always say we don't make widgets, you know, we don't actually create the content, we add value to the content, we shape it, but we don't make it. And so, you know, giving a great service to your authors has to be, has to be at the top of the, the list, you know, quality, great service. And we share all that on a, you know, within our Microsoft Teams, you know, whenever there's a great bit of feedback that goes around to the whole team and that lifts, that really does, I think, make a difference. I mean, it's great when we get awards and, you know, those those things, but actually it's the kind of it's the it's the day to day feedback, you know, where you you feel like you're you're doing something that's that's decent and good. But, you know, I think. You know, I suppose on a personal level, um, I was quite surprised um uh basically i, I was a conferred as an academy i can't even say the word um academician or however you say it, of the academy of social sciences and that's kind of uh, you know in the uk and that's really quite unusual there aren't there really aren't that many non-academics in it and that was because of the the way that the press had really made a difference in in the fields in which we worked and i think that yeah, that that was, you know, that that uh, I find it hard to um, accept. But at the same time, that's a, that's a really lovely thing to have happened. So on a personal level, that's um, and I guess, you know, we 
we have a business advisory board which um uh which uh, meets a couple of times a year and it has two it has external publishers on it and has some university people um and they're quite a they're quite a tough act. So um, it's the ex MD of Oxford University Press, the ex MD of Cambridge University Press, and uh, Palgrave Macmillan Higher Ed. And uh, we had a meeting last week, and and they were just really lovely about what we'd achieved in you know, and those kinds of things where you have people who who you know you respect and who can I mean. Just to be clear, leadership, you know, it's not, it, it's about your team. It's about everybody. It's not about you as an individual. You may be great, you know, you may make some brilliant um, appointments. And I have to say our staff team is fantastic. And that's not me that appointed all of them by any stretch of imagination. But, you know, when you have people in the field who you really respect saying that what you've achieved or the company have achieved, then, yeah, that's, that feels good. Yeah, also we have had, we get a lot of praise from authors, which is very satisfying, also for everybody else in the office. And uh, also what um, what people like, I think, about our for a firm, which would be the same in your case, that we are relatively small. And therefore, I mean, when people come from lot of publishers to us, so they complain about the way they're treated and it's so anonymous in these large firms, whereas in a small firm, especially ours, it's a family firm, you know, Vivian uh, is the managing director, uh, her older brother is our IT director and webmaster, so it's very much a family firm. Again, that's an old tradition. Many German publishing firms have been around for 200 or 250 years, and <clears throat> The Gorka is one of them so that's been around for a long time. And I think people like this because it makes us sort of, they, yeah, as actually someone said to me, one of our employees living while in Oxford, he said, oh, we are really family, aren't we? <laughs> Which I uh, thought was really lovely. And this is also what I think a lot of authors feel, that we are kind of a family and it's not as anonymous as uh, the city in large, in large firms. I think to answer um, to Michael's question here, uh, of course, I agree with everybody on the day to day thing, but I just want to point out two amazing experiences for me. One quite early on um, in the mid 80s, I was in Malaysia and I was talking to a librarian and she said, is it true that Pinter Publishers is taking the place of Macmillan in the social sciences? And we were still small then. And I just straightened up and said, yes. <laughs> I decided, well, that's something to, to work with. And that was about 40 years ago. And seven years ago, I got an honorary doctorate uh, at um, Curtin University. And I remember it was, um, this is in Australia and it was outside the event and and you have to speak at a graduation ceremony and you have to enthuse 1500 students about their lives going forward. And, and you have to wear this very heavy gown and a very heavy hat and you're sitting there sweating away on the podium. And the vice chancellor said to me, um, if you want to, you can take the hat off, uh, the mortarboard. And I looked at her and I said, I've traveled halfway across the world to be able to wear this thing. There's no way I'm going to take it off. <laughs> and it just struck me that, uh, you know, it, it was given to me for my contribution to knowledge dissemination through uh, not just the publishing companies that I'd worked for, but also the industry activities and um, where I'd done a bit in, in open access. And so again, there's another area that is potentially very satisfying if you have a passion about not just what you're doing, but how it's being done, how you're doing it, and how it's being done in the industry. And um, there's a lot that's going to be happening over the next few years with artificial intelligence, particularly, and, you know, it's an area where young people are going to be able to grasp the opportunities 
uh, much more easily than people of, of my generation. And uh, I think there's a lot of, of opportunities to be taken there, whether they uh, dovetail exactly into um, you know conventional publishing or not. Uh, I was at the London Book Fair a couple of weeks ago, and I ran into uh, a, a little tech company. And I have to say, there were more tech stands than there were publisher stands at this large book fair. And there was this little company called Proof Check. And there was a young woman there, and it was obviously very new. So I said, what do you do? And she said, well, we've developed this software that proofreads PDFs and we're offering it to publishers because we think it'll do X, Y, and Z because we're using artificial intelligence and it will cut down the time that people have to spend on proofreading. And I said, that's fantastic. Where are you from? What have you been doing? And it turned out that in 2022, she had completed a, a bachelor's degree at, at the Central European University in Austria in the field of medieval history. So how did she make this move? And how did she become interested in creating something, a tool that is going to be useful for publishers and the publishing community. So that's, again, a whole area that I think is absolutely fascinating uh, to go into. Great, thank you. Thank you so much, ladies. Um, I do want to quickly talk about one point, uh, Lynn, that I believe you brought up, uh, was at a workplace, in any workplace, um, you know, facing sexist comments, um, other discriminatory rhetoric, uh, this can really uh, affect the confidence of a person, right? Any person. Um, so the to the other ladies, I don't want to just post this to Lynn, but to the other ladies as well. Have you? I'm sure. I'm sure as women, we've all experienced uh, some insecurities of some sort at work. Um, and statistically, over 55% of women in a corporate setting face imposter syndrome, the feeling of feeling like you're a fraud at work and that you don't deserve this opportunity. Uh, so I'm curious as to how, if you have experienced um, any such insecurities or um, you know, hit to your confidence at workplace in your careers, uh, and if you have, how did you handle it? Did you, were there instances you know, where you decided to be the bigger person and just stand back and let your work speak for itself? Or you know, did you light their car on fire? Uh, uh, I would love to hear some of your experiences on how you tackled it, um, and if you have any advice for um, everyone listening. It's well, uh, it's an oh go, Allison, please. No, 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 you. <laughs> <laughs> that was a quick mute. <laughs> um. Yeah, it that's a tough one. Uh, it, without question, I think any anyone from um, unfortunately everybody in a professional setting from a certain generation has probably experienced something that, I mean, part of me too, which was was thrilling to see was just suddenly realizing it's not okay to walk down with keys in your hands and think you're going to be okay, or it's not okay. It's actually okay to say this was vastly inappropriate and I was beyond uncomfortable and all those things. So it's a, it's a funny reckoning that happened, uh, sort of things that you accepted that you suddenly realized, I do not want this for my daughter. I don't want this for my sons. I, you know, this is not, this is not the way the professional world should be. Um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, I think earlier or younger, um, you learn how to work mm -hmm. with it. You learn with, how to deal with a certain amount of ego um, uh, and you protect yourself and you protect those around you. Like, I, I'm sorry, that's probably not a very good response, but um, what I'm, what I hope for is that the world of work ha now there's still lots we have to work on, but I do think that there is more awareness now, more recognition, um, even from ourselves on that is not okay. Um, and it's amazing to me to look back and think how I, I knew it wasn't okay, but I, I, I 
didn't voice it as strongly as I certainly would now. Um, so it's a, it's a tough one, uh, but I do I am hopeful for 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 the generation that's the the students listening now. I'm sure you could tell me things that would disappoint me, but I I am hopeful, and I think that voice is critical. And you know what gives me hope is your generation. I just think the generation that's coming into the workforce right now is is so much more aware. Or I mean, it's all relative, but it gives me hope. Uh, that that there's there is more recognition on equity from both the young men and women about not just the young women that are coming in but the young men as well. So, but Allison, you were about to say something, please. No, it's, uh, no, no, that was really yeah, really thoughtful. And I think just picking, I was going to say something different, but picking up on what you're saying, actually, um, so early in my career, way before publishing absolutely outrageous situations in lots and lots of ways in lots of different you know I did I did um you know temporary work in uh, I think I worked out that it was about 30 different different environments and companies from um I uh was uh on a diving boat in the middle of the North Sea for uh several weeks with 95 men and the cook and me there so you can imagine there were there were some interesting kind of things there through to yeah I think the worst was working um, uh, in a photocopier sales team in the 1980s. Not great. But anyway, that's that's beside the point. What I was going to say now is that um, uh, what we've talked about a lot internally is, is actually um, uh, the difficulties that transgender uh, people are facing. And we have, so, you know, we have people who um, uh, would... Um, would uh, self-identify as, as non-binary and when I hear about some of the things that they've had to deal with actually just out in the out in not in the workplace but out in the world I think that's something that we you know we, you know maybe life has moved on for uh, for 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 women um, but um, yeah but there are some really difficult situations there and I guess I just want to recognize that I mean I, I you know in terms of the the uh, imposter syndrome, I mean, you know, I, I would be a classic imposter syndrome gal, I have to say. Um, I am still waiting for somebody to tap me on the shoulder and say, what are you doing here? Um, you know, uh, you know, obviously from without, um, except for the, this brief period at Bloomsbury, which was just about a year, um, I haven't done the kind of the corporate hierarchy and taught myself everything that there was about publishing you know I mean I literally sat there with books and talked to people and learned how to you know all the different aspects and then of course you end up employing people who know as you should do far more than you about all the different areas and the different specialisms and um, I did learn finance quite early though that wasn't the one thing I, I did do because I thought yeah that was really important but I think that um, that even after 33 years I think it's still hard to believe that kind of learning on the job and being self-taught and not having that kind of formal program or, you know, I'm really, I'm really envious of the of the students here who've gone through a, a formal training program. I think it's fantastic. I would, you know, I'd love to go do it now. <laughs> I'm sure I would, I'm sure I'd learn a lot. But I think, you know, the advice I guess would just be. You know, you just have to take a deep breath and 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 get on with it. You know, I mean, and I and don't quit. I mean, I think we were talking actually the panelists before we started about. I still uh, I still get nervous about giving presentations. It's something my co my colleague uh, Joe Gregg is 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 I can see is on the uh, is on the call and uh, and she's constantly telling me that uh, it, it's all fine and it's a good thing to do. And yet I, you know, even before here, I, you know, this, I will have got very nervous about it. And somehow, you know, you just have to, I suppose what I'm trying to say is you have to just put the discomfort to one side. And that's the advice I would give is that, you know, if it's important enough, you just have to go with it and, and you know, feel the fear and do it anyway. An old, uh, an old adage, but one that I think is still important. Listening to all of you, it's uh, just a couple of thoughts have come to my mind. Um, I don't recall experiencing serious sexism, but I do recall as a younger person some kind of implicit 
belief that men understood things better than women, that they knew the answers perhaps in publishing better than women. And I'm not sure where that came from, uh, but I, once I recognized it, I tried to get rid of it just as quickly as possible. <laughs> the other thing is we're all talking about how much we taught ourselves as we were on the job. But I would like to just say, don't use your wonderful courses as a crutch because I have noticed uh, some people, some young people who've had fabulous training in publishing come into publishing thinking, well, I'll, I'll just check what my textbook said to me about this problem and then I will get the right solution. Actually, publishing is a, is a the wonderful thing about it is, is the mix of knowledge, experience and intuition. And it's the way those things come together that make it so amazingly special and different every single day. I'd like to respond a little bit to um, Michael sent a comment about um, curiosity among the, the panelists and um, any comments or advice to younger people and um, communication skills. I think, you know, we like to talk, but um, the curiosity struck me. Uh, I think that being curious is a really important attribute for publishers. Uh, I mean, whether you're in marketing or editorial um, and, and, you know, in management, but if you're in management, you came up through something else um, because being curious about what someone's working on um, or who would, you know, why they're working on it, um, who they think will be interested in it. I mean, for one thing, you get, you have this lifelong education that you get. Um, when you publish, well, you know, I publish academic books. I, I think we all are in that, generally in that space. So I feel like I've gotten such an amazing education, but you don't, you won't get it if you're not interested, if you're not listening. So if it's just, um, I remember talking to an acquisitions editor once at a large company and um, it was like, well, I just need to get a certain number of books, you know, and that does not lead to a very fulfilling uh, career in my opinion. I think that that curiosity and also um, people who write books, they like to talk about what they're doing. Um, so, you know, being able to ask questions because you're really interested. I think that people can tell um, that you are interested. So um, I think that, you know, genuine curiosity is something to um, allow yourself to have. And there's nothing wrong with saying to somebody, I don't know what that means. Um, can you explain that to me? Um, I think that, that that works really well. And um, being a woman, things have changed enormously um, you know, to what Jessica was saying. Um, and yes, uh, in the early days, well, going back to Westview, yes, I was at a conference and I said, yes, I, you know, we're interested in publishing this book. And someone said to me, they let you make decisions like that? I <laughs> mean, just like that. But I simply said, yes, they do. Um, and I think that you have to choose your battles. Um, if you can use something to your advantage, then you do. I mean, I found in my career that sometimes people didn't take me seriously for the first 15 minutes. That's an advantage, you know? They weren't taking things seriously. I was. Um, and so I, I essentially prevailed. Um, uh, and somebody said that humility can be healthy, um, giving an accompanying impulse to continue learning. Well, I mean, if you got to choose between humility and arrogance, I'd say humility is going to be the better way to go. Um, <laughs> you know, so, and I just have to throw out one little thing going back to a previous um, thing, and then I'll shut up for a while. Um, when we were talking about um, moments that made us really happy, um, there is a really important one. Um, for me, and that is the day that a librarian said to me, oh, we know your company. We never return your books. That was one of my happiest moments. Um, so I just wanted to mention that. 
<laughs> Thank you so much, everybody, for all of this just fascinating advice and feedback. Um, I think we're going to open it up to some questions. Um, either online, please feel free to turn on your camera and your mic and ask uh, online or in person if anybody in our audience has any questions for our panelists today. Um, please, please go right ahead. Or also in the chat, if you don't want to yes. turn your camera on and feel free to pop it right there. While we're waiting for a question, Lynn, I just wanted to, sh uh, uh, for me, it's always curiosity and drive. It's those mm -hmm. two things together that I, I, when I, when I admire people or hire people or look at, at, at those two qualities to me are such a wonderful combination. You need to be curious, but you also have the drive, the drive to kind the drive. Of, yeah, yeah, that's the choices. Yeah. Please, people, yeah. people, um, ask, please ask questions. <laughs> I have one. Um, at, for whoever cares to answer, I've found that it's often easier to say no to whatever project or thing because then you don't have to do anything. When you say yes, the trouble starts. There's a lot to do. Any comments? Be careful that when you say yes, you can deliver on it. Yeah, I I mean, I I sometimes think, I think we sometimes have a harder time saying no than we do saying yes. And that's because, you know, um, I mean, back to the authors, we like to please our authors, you know, um, I think uh, we, uh, we don't um, just work by the bottom. I mean, so money matters and we have to, we absolutely have to make enough money to, cover, you know, cover our costs. But at the same time, we have a social mission and a scholarly mission, and we can easily find an answer to why we should publish something. If we talk about publishing something, it will sit under one of those, you know, one of those things, and we have to be quite firm with ourselves. Um, I think uh, it depends what kind of a project, you know, um, if you're taking on, and we built, we, we are, you know, we built a platform where we're bringing together our book content and our journal content. And unless we had our operations director, at, um, Andy, um, on on side, we definitely wouldn't have done that. We needed somebody who absolutely could make that kind of make that happen and 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 work through a big complex um, IT project. But yes, I think sometimes saying no is is. <laughs> yeah, I think there was just a comment from Allison in the chat. Um, I think that's one of the most important things to learn is how to say no, and sometimes you have to say no uh, at a uh, a difficult point, um, but there's an art to it and there's an importance to it. Um, it's sometimes easier just to go with the flow when you know actually this isn't right for whatever reason that you're you're saying. So learning to say no um, and helping your people learn to say no when it's not appropriate, I think is harder. That, but also if you get want to get something done, ask a busy person. So that is another adage that where I, that's a lot of saying yes, and I do find that quite true. I did have one previous question in the chat that I pertains to the entrepreneurs uh, on the panel. Um, it was a question about business development when it comes to finding your own, uh, founding your own publishing. So, can any of you speak to that experience? Any advice or tips that you have for young uh, entrepreneurs? I was going to respond to that. I was wondering. I think it's someone named Kate. Um, but could I respond quickly to T. Gasparini? about um, yeah, how, do we, yeah, how do we make adequate space for curiosity in day-to-day -day practice? Um, that is how you will achieve your goals. You know, I mean, curiosity, maybe other people are gonna judge you on the number of books that you, um, that you generate, but first of all, if you don't enjoy your job, you're gonna burn out and not stay with it. Um, second, how, curiosity is a way to um, generate books and you're not gonna, have a good list if you don't have, um, if you don't start from being curious, in, in my opinion. But I'm sorry, back to what the our moderators were saying. But yeah, someone had asked a question about, um, you know, advice. Um, I, I would love it if that person would ask the panelists some specific questions that they are concerns that they have, because it's hard to just say, 
here's advice for entrepreneurs. I think listening to you guys, I would, uh, and this is, I would emphasize no matter what you're doing, the financial literacy piece of uh, both your business and your personal life um, is super critical. And there are books and there are YouTube videos and there are all sorts of things, but that is empowerment in my mind. And listening to the founders talk about, I wish I'd known it at this point or that point. It took me a while to to build that literacy as well, even though I work for large companies but I knew sometimes my I would be like, I call bullshit, but I can't say why. When you learn to, to really sort of pinpoint why that that that's not accurate and can speak that language, that is good. And it makes your creative life more interesting with work. It really does when you have that backbone as well. I'd strongly recommend that. I mean, I think it's interesting. So even working as I described in a, you know, in a company where I mentioned about cash flow, but actually the only way we got to be Bristol University Press was because every penny that was spent all the way through, A, was self-generated, but but was counted as if it was my own. There is no other way that we would have done it. Mm -hmm. So the reason why it took 20 years to do the Bristol University Press thing is because we demonstrated year after year, very careful. We always hit our targets. We always hit our... And I think that... that um, Financial literacy was absolutely at the heart of that. I, you know, it, well, it was, um, well, we wouldn't have survived otherwise. And that was because actually I had the opposite. I didn't have the bank manager and, and my house on the line, but I, back to the imposter, I, you know, I just thought we'd be closed down and the people that worked with me would be, would lose their jobs. And so you are absolutely, I, I'm with everybody about financial literacy. Can I, can I ask something else? Sorry to have so many questions, but, uh, this is an amazing opportunity. Uh, a mentor of mine once said, Michael, sometimes being right isn't the point. It, I, was, it was, I was thunderstruck and couldn't believe I was so old when I learned that lesson. Can you comment on that uh, when being right is important or, or not the point? I don't want to be the only one who's who's talking. Um, I think um, sometimes in dealing with employees, that's important. That um, that's been a hard lesson for me to learn because, like a lot of people um, who do the kinds of things we do, um, I like to control things, um, and you can't control everything. And so, if you want other people to feel empowered, you might be right that you could have done task X or project Y better. That, but that doesn't mean that that's the right thing to do. Um, sometimes letting someone else do something that's good enough, maybe it's, you know, maybe it's not as good as it could, but it's good enough. Sometimes that, that it's better to let somebody else be right. Um, you know, when you're working with staff, and that's one thing that comes to my mind. I'm going to take a different position on that. I'm. I agree. Uh, that certainly there are times when it's better to let things go. Uh, but I think one of the things that's always been a challenge to me is when am I um, being too indulgent with a member of staff? When do I think they have more promise than they do? When do I excuse certain things that they do wrong? When do I delay firing them, for instance? Uh, and curiously enough, everybody I have fired has usually come back and said, that was the best thing that could happen to me because I was in the wrong slot in your company and I found a different job that's more satisfying. But be that as it may, um, getting the right team together for anything, whether you're a team inside a big company or a small team because you are a small company, um, you have to balance the wish for everybody to do as well as they possibly can and what you want them to do with recognizing when they do fall short and then dealing with that in a, a civil uh, and sympathetic way.
I think uh, my, it's an interesting, maybe this will be a bit controversial, but there's a difference between being right and getting what you want. Um, and um, when I think when it comes to working with people, uh, and I and I do think actually, as you start managing more people and you are looking at the organization more as it, from a leadership point of view, you have to consider um, comes less and less, I think Alison already said this, but less and less about you and your personal performance and your own. And it's hard for a lot of folks that are very good at what they do. Um, you could continue to try to do what you're doing, but it's now it's about bringing out the best in the people around you. Um, and it's also about uh, negotiating with authors, with others, and making sure that everybody's coming out um, at their best as much as you can and ensure. So being right in those situations is often not what's important. It's about getting what you want, which is maybe a functional team or a great author producing more for you. Or um, so I think that's where I see that that comment. Well, I think we have to live with a lot of ambiguity. I think there's a lot where we're having to hold to opposing views. Actually, being right sometimes is is not possible. There are, you know, I sit in meetings quite a lot where there there are um you know there isn't the right the right approach you know that you know being right so being right I suppose is different from the right approach but but you know I I do think a lot of our a lot of life is gray it's not black and white actually and it's about negotiating that way that path that path through and um and you know I uh, and I'm sure my staff team would still say I I really struggle with not going yes as I said or I thought that before or you know that that tendency to you know to to kind of um, own things that yeah maybe you did think or maybe you did say you know you know some time ago it's it's um, it's not right <laughs> you know if you're talking about not right you know actually people need to you know they need to to come to things themselves okay so you know and and be able to give the space and time for people to to to, to really develop that and yeah you may have thought of one element of it you certainly won't have thought of all of them and and you know and I think that it's back to that bit about humility isn't it and just the you know the importance of that I think and and sometimes when we're always thinking what's next what's next you know you know you, you know we may have thought several several stages ahead because that's how our brains are um uh, are wired in relation to our business but actually it's it's much more important that people come to the table with 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 their version of it rather than you trying to own it i think i'd like to respond to two of the comments um one having to do with what we're talking about being right um and one of the person when person was talking about I'm asking about how endeavors that don't always go according to plan. Um, I found it really important to um, be honest when I'm wrong. You know, just I messed up. I made a mistake. You know, I I don't know whether it's a little thing like I got my numbers mixed up or I just made a bad decision because I feel like it's important for the people who work with us to feel like it's okay for them to make a mistake. And um, if they know that it's, that I can make make a mistake and be open about it, because one of the things that really makes me unhappy is if something goes wrong and somebody makes excuses, um, you know, it's like, no, I mean, it was just, it was a mistake, <laughs> you know? And so I feel like by being able to admit my own mistakes, um, that that opens it up for other people to do the same. So, um, you know, endeavors that don't go according, according to plan, how do you approach this in your leadership? Well, I messed up, you know, I, I think that's important. And I don't know how many other people will be interested in an answer to, um, you're working on a project and um, you think that if if the book existed that there would be more classes teaching it. Um, in my long experience, <laughs> that is never true. If somebody wants to teach a class, there's enough material out there that they can teach a class. Um, but I will say that if you really, that, that your idea um, sounds interesting and there are publishers out there in the craft space that do books that have photographs and histories that are for a, gen a more general audience. And I would encourage you to look in that direction. I do want to give our in-person audience a chance to ask some questions. And I believe 
Yeah, um, I do have a question. Um, earlier, Francis mentioned artificial intelligence, um, but this question is for everyone. There's already been so many like technological developments in all of your careers, and I'm curious to see how you think publishing, like the publishing field, will adapt to artificial intelligence and how smaller versus larger publishers will be affected in like the early stages of uh, adapting ad adapting to artificial intelligence. <laughs> I'm happy to go in unless somebody else wants to. Oh, Allison, go, please. No, I, 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 I mean, it's a, it's a hard question. It's something that we're, we're, we're talking about a lot um, uh, at work and, uh, and our team. And I mean, I think we've we've spent some time trying to think about the opportunities and obviously the risks and how we we manage and, and navigate that. And I think there are both of those things are true and real. And I mean, I absolutely, in my opinion, it will it will transform publishing. It will. Um, for the scholarly space, I think one of the things that we have talked about a lot internally is is the sort of moral dilemma and uh, which is that um, if we share our peer reviewed content, so this is highly, you know, um, uh, this is content that we believe to be uh, as true as possible, if you could, if you, if you believe in truth, but you know, is, is evidence based, research based. So if we don't share that with the um, with the providers with the algorithms that are that are training AI, we will not be counterbalancing what is actually out there, which is a lot of um, you know um, unsubstantiated uh, uh, content and and uh, and work. However, for our own IP, for our own um, uh, for our own sake going forward, actually holding on to our, our IP and keeping it within our companies, so that we become areas of expertise that people come to to get to get content that isn't actually um, uh, you know been been um, manipulated in any way by by false information is actually something that that is maybe precious for a university press. And so I've talked to other UPs about that and about how you get that balance. And is that, you know, I don't know. It's a, it's a kind of dilemma, I, I think, um, and one that's that's very real for university presses and the other scholarly presses where, you know, the, the quality of their content and the, you know, is, is, is what, you know, their company is based on. Um, so, yeah. If I can just comment on what Allison said, I think there's um, there's two aspects of AI in my mind. I'm oversimplifying, but there's the work processes, which will enable, I'm hoping, a lot of the mundane tasks to be uh, simplified. Things like um, uh, so much about discoverability and tagging and uh, it's really important aspects of our business that I think it would be lovely to see that um, uh, AI help us on some of those challenges. I, like Allison, I think there's a real place for peer-reviewed vetted content when it comes to training LLMs. I, my personal view, not the press's view, my personal view is we should be having a seat at the table and it's not mutually exclusive. I think that peer-reviewed value content, and I've just been two and a half years into this space, but it is amazing and very, very relevant in the world right now that we live in. Um, the value of the content is 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 recognized and will become increasingly valuable. I just think that it's going to be fewer people maybe that have access to it and care, uh, but it is important that that content is available both, I think, within our presses, but also that we're part of the conversation on the LLMs because that's where the vast majority of people are going to get that information. Um, and to me, it's like the calculator, the internet, and something else all combined in one instance. Uh, so it's going to be fascinating. And uh, I'm happy I'm at the start end of it. But you guys in that room and those on the uh, that, that are students, wow, you've got a really amazing, interesting time ahead of you getting into publishing at this point. Um, it's I think it's going to be fascinating. Thank you all. I think uh, we have a question in the chat that asks if any of you have ever faced burnout, and if so, how did you feel like you were able to bounce back?
good night's sleep helps. <laughs> take a few days off or take you know, take a vacation. Watch movies with happy endings. That's what I think. That's one of mine. Movies with happy endings. <laughs> I, you know, but seriously, well, seriously, I think um, if you burnout is a real thing, but if you're doing something that you really like doing, um, it's a matter of pacing and and you know stepping back sometimes, taking that time off, taking you know going to where wherever your happy place is, and, you know, a, a Caribbean island or you know whatever, or or just stay. Uh, you know, I I have tried to do. Uh, I'm staying home for a week. You know, I'm not going anywhere. I'm not getting on an airplane. I'm just doing some errands, going for long walks, catching up with my laundry. You know, that helps a lot. But I think that the kind of burnout that makes people say, you know, I I, I just don't want to, I don't want to go back to the office. You know, I, I just, I don't want to be doing this job anymore. I and mean, that's not just burnout. I think that's, you need to look at, and I think Jessica was talking about this earlier. You need to talk about, maybe it was time, it's past time to leave that, you know, you're in the wrong job. Yeah, I mean, I'll go back to the previous. Sorry, can I go back to the previous question about AI? Um, I'm I've been thinking a lot about how it's going to impact our industry, and I I've watched over the decades periods of great consolidation when the big companies have bought the small companies and everybody said, oh dear, it's the end of small companies because the big companies have bought everybody who's around and worth buying. And, and then of course the green shoots have started again and you see new small companies. And I've seen this all over the world, this urge to publish and be a publisher. I've even seen it in Mongolia where I worked with half a dozen printers who wanted to become publishers, not just printers. And it, 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 it's kind of an urge of a lot of people to become publishers and they care about what they're publishing and they want to do it on their own. And they set up their own small companies and some of them work with their small companies forever and some of them sell out to the bigger companies. What I'm concerned about over the next decade is that the bigger companies are actually going to be less interested in content and more interested in tech. The smaller companies are not going to have the, the capital to risk taking this decision or that decision about certain tools that have an AI basis to them and they they can actually hurt their own businesses by not having the right tech information to make good decisions. Uh, whereas the big companies can invest a lot, they may get it wrong, but they'll have enough capital base to, to switch then to some other horse and 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 correct whatever mistakes they're inevitably going to make going down the line. So if you're thinking about a career in publishing and you also like the tech stuff, make sure you take those skills with you uh, because whether you work with small company or big company, uh, you will be welcomed with open arms. Thank you. I believe we have one more in-person question. We have five more, so I believe we can take one more. Yeah, thank you. Um, just as all women in publishing leadership specifically, I was wondering if you could speak to how you manage uh, hiring people. I know a lot of women in leadership can feel like there's a quota for how many women can be in an office and might uh, and in some cases feel like if they might be bringing their own competition, um, especially for those who have started your own companies, how have you handled that hiring process and making sure you're getting a diverse range of voices while, um, yeah. <laughs> oh, uh, I, yeah, to jump in. I mean, I have to say that uh, for a 
very considerable amount of time, we had one or two men in a company of 15, 16. We actually found it quite hard to appoint men, which is which sounds, you know, kind of counterintuitive. But I, I think, you know, it's almost like the opposite problem. You know, if you end up being um, you can end up being female dominated and and, you know, um, one of the things that um, we reflected on a lot internally was about the fact that just as uh, men maybe, you know, have traditionally appointed in their own image, well, I would suggest that women can do that equally, that the things that they are looking for in in um, uh, in uh, candidates can, you know, it can also be self-replicating um, and that we really, really have to work hard to against that. I mean, at one level, I was, you know, we were really proud that we were an all-female senior management team until a few years ago. Um, but uh, on another, you know, I was really, we were really clear that actually we really need to be much more diverse. So, you know, so I think it's, it, it is interesting. I mean, I think we still have 78% of our, workforce identify as women you know with 16 percent men two percent non-binary and uh 4.5 percent who uh, prefer not to prefer not to say or don't self self-describe and i just wrote those down before coming in you know and, and i think it is really important to get diverse voices into the organization you know whether that is you know a male dominated organization that's trying to get women in or women female dominated organization that's trying to get men in and i i don't think we have ever you know um we certainly not consciously tried to keep anybody out but i think it's about the environment you create and the kind of ethos and the kind of things that you look for in 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 your staff team um, I don't know whether I've answered that, but, you know, but but essentially, I mean, we have all sorts of, mo you know, uh, everybody has to apply to an application process. We actually don't have any um, names on any of the applications. There are lots of things we do in order to try and be, you know, uh, unbiased in our selection criteria. But at the end of the day, I do still think that we maybe value aspects that could be seen more, uh, you know, more readily in the you know the kind of female approaches to things. No, but is that isn't that a bit of a luxury for a smaller firm? Uh, I mean, um, when we now advertise for a job, as we have recently done again, it was so hard to get uh, sufficient uh, applications, and to and you really have to go by who seems the best candidate. And I think it's a bit of a luxury then to pay attention to these other, you know, uh, areas now that have become all of a sudden very important or fashionable. So we, we can just go by who seems to be the best uh, and candidate. And um, that is really the most important uh, aspect for us. And whatever, I mean, at Futsun we're talking about, um, there are very few blacks. If they don't apply, what do we do? We can't force people to apply, especially not in, in a smaller firm. So we have to make do with what we have and hope that we find or appoint the best candidate uh, available. up on our kind of scheduled time but you guys have had such interesting thoughts and and such great advice today from, from such wide spanning careers um so i want to start by thanking all of our panelists for taking the time today um and all of the work you put in with us here to organize it <laughs> this has been really illuminating covering these diverse experiences and technological advancements um and hearing about all of your personal journeys um, Are you sharing? Yeah. Oh, sorry. I mean, well, um, the students. Um, I, I'm happy to answer, and I think most, all of us are um, happy to answer questions from um, from students um, if they have questions they would like to ask that are specific to um, you know to any of us. Um, if somebody want sent me an email, um, I would probably respond by saying. Okay, what's your phone number? I'll call you because that's who I am. But um, you know, and I don't want to speak for other people, but based on my 
experience with these people and others. Um, yeah, if any of the students in the audience would like to answer specific questions, I'm certainly happy to um, have my information shared. Thank you for answering. I believe that that would really help a lot of uh, a lot of uh, young professionals and students. So thank you. Yeah, I think I think with that we're ready to close. Uh, we we did we did notice that a lot of questions and comments were in the chat that we could not get to, but. Uh, we'll try to address these via email. The recording will be sent. Uh, thanks again. Thank you so much, everyone. This was a great panel. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Yeah, and it's been great to hear what my colleagues had to say as well. So that was great. Yeah. So, yeah. Have a so great rest of your day. Okay. <laughs> Bye. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye.